We all know the scripture from Hebrews 4, 12, and I'm going to read it to you. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Today, I want to unpack what this scripture really means in our Christian life and especially look at it through the lens as a physician. So we'll be right back after this little intro. Welcome to the Heal the Healers podcast, where we explore the intersection of faith and medicine, discover your God-given potential and experience Christ's healing in the midst of medical burnout. I'm your host, Inga Hoffman, a pediatric hemonc doc, physician coach, and follower of Jesus. Together, we will navigate the challenges of medicine, integrate faith into our personal and professional lives, experience spiritual renewal, and find restoration in Christ. Welcome to the Heal the Healers, where Christ heals one physician and one patient at a time. Welcome back to the Heal the Healers podcast and YouTube show. I am excited to share with you today very personal revelation about scripture that I got earlier this year that really helped me understand the scripture of Hebrews 4.12, where it talks about the word of God being a double-edged sword. Before I go there, I want to share a very personal story that just happened to me very recently, just a week ago, where I was very convicted of my personal actions in a public space. I was taking my son to a conference and um, they were playing games. It was all about tech and computers, etc. And they were playing a competitive game about hacking, essentially. And I am in medicine, I have no clue how hacking works, and I wouldn't be able to understand a single word what my son is doing at his young age. Um, so I couldn't really help him with any of the tasks. And that was good because that was my role. I was there to support. But there were some other families that were in this industry that knew exactly what to do. And some assisted their kids with these games to get a leading edge. And who wouldn't, right? But in a way, it seemed very unfair. And I think my son was a little bit upset about it, but he coped really well. And I, on um, some level, was like, well, that's not quite right. So what happened is I spoke to him about this. And I was trying to be a road role model and say, hey, you are doing this on your own. And you function with integrity. And all this was true. And from a personal development standpoint, I was like rocking my personal development lessons, right? Hey, you're operating out of integrity. You're doing the right thing, not cheating in the game, not involving your parents, etc. And as I got home, I suddenly felt not so good about what I actually said, because I know probably others around us heard the conversation. And that was actually not as loving and kind. As I was reading scriptures just a few days ago, I was sitting on my porch in my quiet time, and the word of God convicted me so much about my actions and my behavior, even they were well-intended and out of a coaching, personal development mindset, I realized that I was not loving, not kind to the others, that in a way I was judging versus just being quiet. I didn't have to say these things out loud and certainly not in the environment. I could have told my son these things afterwards. I was trying to be encouraging, but in the same way I was encouraging my son with good words. I was placing judgment on others. And to be honest, when I was reading even deeper in the words of the Gospels, the words of Jesus, where he spoke about the Sermon of the Mount, we spoke about you don't even see your own splinter, but you're trying to get this big wooden log out of somebody else's face. That really convicted me because as I was thinking back, I didn't really help him that much. But there was one question where I saw that he made a little mistake, something I could easily fix, which was converting time zones. Well, I did help. I saw 
that I'm not operating with the same integrity either, that I was looking for others to, meaning don't help your kid at all. This is a kid's game. Well, that was really interesting. And it was such a beautiful illustration for me to be convicted by the word of God, to go and pray, repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Not only did I not do what your word says, but I also wasn't a good witness. What would a good witness do in this situation to show the kingdom of God, how the kingdom of God operates and how we should be loving and caring towards others, even when they do wrong, even when our enemy is trying to get a slice ahead in the game, that we are blessing our enemies, that we pray for them, that we will be gentle and kind. Now, don't let that get confused with calling out sin. Just like Jesus, we love the people, but we call out the sin. That's a whole different topic, but I just want to clarify that. So that is my backstory, a very personal, raw story that happened just a few days ago, how the word of God was exactly doing that. It divided so sharply and showed me so exactly Inga, here is where I want you to work on. Here is where you need to repent and ask for forgiveness. And that was so beautiful. So let's dive into the scripture and why I call this episode Sharpen Your Scalpel. So uh, the word of God in Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to divine vining a soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Exactly that's what it did for me and that purpose. It judged my attitude and it judged my heart, my very deepest thought in that moment when I was with my kid at the hacking conference. Because what was my thought? That's not fair. They rig the game. They're kind of cheated a bit. That's not fair. I want my son to win because honestly, he was way ahead of everybody. And that's, again, I, I don't want to sound prideful, but there was the seed of pride in my heart that I want him to stay ahead because it was great to see him suddenly thriving. But the word of God convicted me in my thoughts in my desires of my heart and in my actions. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for doing that to us. And thank you for giving us your word, Lord, to convict us. And this happens all the time, every day. And we should be grateful for the word of God to be a guide in convicting us and not judging us for eternity. We can get correction from the word of God in our actions, in our thoughts, in our behavior, so we can live a life that is glorifying to him. But to be honest, I did not realize that scripture and understand it to the deepest level that I do now. Let me explain that. I have been convicted many times over by the word of God. And hopefully we all have, you know, as we're reading the word of God, the Bible, that we get convicted. We will still sin, but that we will live a righteous life and try to walk with Jesus in that same way. And I always thought, I sort of understand the scripture. Basically, scripture reveals something to you and it shows you what's in your heart. But I never really quite understood and quite got that double-edged sword part and the dividing of bone and joints and marrow. And I'm a pediatric hemonc doc and also boarded in hematopathology. So I geek out about the bone marrow. And when scripture mentions bone marrow, I'm all ears. I'm like, wow, I want to hear about that because that's, that's my thing. I'm a bone marrow transplant doc. I'm all about the marrow. So what happened is that in the spring earlier this year, I was sitting in a prayer meeting and it was that moment that womb, the spirit just showed me so clearly, this is what the scripture means. And he illustrated it to me in a way that I, as a physician, could relate and understand. And I want to convey this to you in the hopes that you can understand it better and incorporate it in your life as a physician, as well as in your personal life. We all know this scripture very well. Some of us can probably even recite it. 
But what does it truly mean? Dividing soul and spirit, that is a lesson we can just unpack itself. But basically, there's a spirit, there's our soul, our emotions, our thoughts um, that the Bible often describes sits in our heart, but in fact, we know all that stuff sits in our mind. And then there's obviously our body. We give much more power to our soul, meaning our emotions, our thoughts, all these things. When the Bible tells us, no, spirit is actually what leads. That's a whole nother lesson. It also talks about it divides joint and marrow. That really clicked with me because I was thinking, well, joint represents bones and marrow. That is incredibly hard to dissect. Now, if you would be a surgeon, that is really microsurgery if you want to do it on a patient sort of life, or it would be very barbaric, right? You have to take a bone out and scrape all the marrow out to clean it and separate from its bone. That is a hard surgery to do, or it will be very barbaric because you couldn't do it within a patient to just divide that. At least these are the images that came to me. I was thinking in that moment, God's word is really like microsurgery. It's like a robotic surgery, microsurgery as its finest. Any of you surgeons out there, kudos to you. And you probably can explain how it works in surgery. God is so decisive and divisive and pristine and exact in his intent, in his actions, in his operation, and in his word to give us precise, absolutely divine microsurgery in our own lives, revealing things to us, cutting things off that are no longer serving us, showing us where we need to repent, like in my example. And isn't that amazing? God is really the best surgeon out there. And he does it in such a gentle, loving way. Even though it sometimes seems it hurts, he does it in an amazing way. And why is this important as a physician and in our culture and medicine? I thought about a couple examples that I want to share. Number one, if we think about medicine in the academic healthcare system and healthcare in general, it is so infiltrated by things that are clearly not of God. We see all sorts of problems in our medical system Burnout, people getting taken advantage of, feeling like a clock in the wheel. I talk about all these things a lot on the Academic Revolution podcast. And where's the burnout and that pain and despair that we sometimes feel in medicine coming from? It often comes from a culture of greed and self-centeredness. You know, I strongly believe this is not how God wants us to operate medicine. And if he had a hospital, it wouldn't look at all anything like this. Jesus healed the sick, and he healed it by the power of his word. And that's a whole another topic we're going to dive into at other times for sure, because it is amazing to study what he did. But our medical world is infiltrated. And how do we separate ourselves out from that environment? And again, it will need microscopic surgery. It will need, in other words, the word of God to show us where are we serving with God's intention and in his values and the way we should operate under the kingdom of God or where are there ways in medicine that are not aligned with his word, either how we show up, how we lead, how we interact with patients or colleagues, or even things within the system that we need to be discerning about and clear about. And God's word is really a guide for us to separate that out like a sharp scalpel to cut in there and give us wisdom and knowledge how to deal with every situation and also to separate us out so we can lead in a good way and serve people better. That is the intent, right? We want to serve our patients better, serve the institution, but in integrity with the word of God and everything that it teaches and instructs us to do. Honestly, as physicians, it's sometimes hard, even as people, right? One day we're on Holy Spirit cloud nine. The word of God is filling us. We like, I got this. I feel steadfast and secure in my faith. And the next moment we get triggered by somebody at work, 
uh, a, a difficult patient or we yell at our kids because we are exhausted. We have all been there. It can be very challenging. And again, this is why clinging to the word of God to show us these things and refine us is so important for our spiritual formation to become stronger in our faith and to walk in more holiness and righteousness. Not that we ever achieve it because that's why Jesus died for us, right? So it's impossible for us to really walk that righteous, holy path without correction from the word of God, without a non-invasive surgery from God to get rid of some things. The other image that came to mind is a tumor surgeon. As I mentioned, I'm Pete's oncologist. I've observed a number of surgeries on my patients. And there are particular patients that actually come to mind scenarios where the tumor was so deeply infiltrated in the child's abdominal cavity, all the vital organs, all the vital vessels. And how a surgeon, thank you, bless your hands, surgeons, was able to scrape that tumor off, that invasive tumor off, to get rid of the, the bad, the evil, right, the cancer, and preserve the healthy organs best that I could. And surgeons are so skilled in that. Thank God for you guys. That really illustrated to me another image of how precise God is, better than even the best tumor surgeon and microscopic or robotic surgeon in the world. He is so precise, getting at the root of evil in our lives and cutting it and removing it with preserving all the good and the healthy and isn't that a blessing? So God is not an ordinary surgeon. His word is not an ordinary word. It's a divine word. And there's also another thing that I hated to hear when I heard it from the surgeon. This is an inoperable cancer. That often meant the tumor was very infiltrated, very much spread. We had to give chemo first to hopefully shrink it. Sometimes that works. Sometimes that doesn't, right? But with the Lord, with God, there is no word. This is an inoperable cancer. It doesn't exist in his knowledge or in his word. He can operate anything out, any trauma, any difficulties, any difficult situations or memories you have from patients, any difficult situations with collaborators or colleagues. He can reduce deem and heal those things. And isn't that amazing? And he will do it so exact that the bad will be gone and the good will be still left holy and intact and that he will then completely restore you and make you whole. That is how God heals us from the inside out through his word, through his Holy Spirit, through his power, Thank you, Lord Jesus, for that. So how does he do it? Well, I don't understand all that he does, but his word is definitely a powerful part, and that's why it's the double-edged sword. That's why it's so powerful, because it transforms us. Again, like I gave that example, how did it transform me? That little incident showed me, Inga, be mindful and watch your mouth. Watch your heart and your mind, what is in there, because, right, what comes out of our tongue is usually what is in our heart. It shows me what is still there that needs to be cleaned up, repented of, and corrected. And that is amazing. So that's how we reach transformation. And it is a lifetime of an activity. We will never cross the finish line until we die or until the Lord calls us home, right? It will be an ongoing process. But thanks to God for his grace and wisdom, to have mercy on us, to give us his word and allow us that correction. And for Jesus to give us that forgiveness. That is amazing. So we will still sin, of course, right? Sin doesn't go away, but the Lord will correct us. And through his correction, if we are obedient to his instruction, he can heal and mend us back together and restore us and make us better in the process and create an image more like him. And that's what we all want to do. We want to present God and his kingdom well on the earth. And if we just like everybody else, we cannot do that because then they rightfully say, you Christians are not any better. In fact, oftentimes we can be worse. And 
we have to watch for that. That we are good witness. Okay. So another aspect that I wanted to look at. So how does that apply to our lives? I talked sort of a little bit more general, but it applies to our personal life, right? So where do we need correction from the word of God? Where do we need that divine intervention, that cutting like a scalpel, a double edged scalpel that we need in our family, with our children, especially? I think us moms are very prone, myself included, or I say this because I've experienced this. That we can be great with everyone else. We are great with our patients, with our co-workers, but well, when we get home, we lose it. We need correction there. I need a lot of correction there um, so that I raise my children in the word of God and not speak words over them that are really not of God because they're based on my own fears. A whole another topic. But it also applies to our patients. Having discernment, that insight from the Lord, how we see through the word and through conviction of his word in desperate situations, how to handle difficult situations with colleagues or even with patients to have godly wisdom there. Now, the last thing I want to say about this, all this must have one thing and you must use your guide. You have to really use discernment here. And where does that come from? When we believe in Jesus, he left us the Holy Spirit who instructs us in all things. So you have to have divine inspiration and knowledge and understanding from the Holy Spirit. And why are we convicted by these scriptures one time and not another time? Because at that moment, the Holy Spirit comes in and shows us Inga, Jessica, Jennifer, Tom, whoever you are out there, look at the scripture and it suddenly becomes clear. That's why I read the scripture for years and I sort of understood it, but it really hit at a certain moment in time. And I still remember that point in time. What happened? The Holy Spirit revealed another layer. I had another revelation. The curtain was pulled away and I had a deeper look what is in front of me. And that's what God does. That's what the Holy Spirit does. So be sensitive to tune in to his prompting when he wants to show you something and don't ignore it. And you need a guide, right? You need the Holy Spirit to show you these things. Just like you don't want a complex surgery, a tumor surgery done by just the intern or the med student, you have a senior most experienced attending on the case. That's your guide. Probably not a perfect comparison, but to get the gist, you need to have the Holy Spirit that reveals all things to you. That's what Jesus talked to us about. That's our world-class surgeon. The word of God is the scalpel and the skill, the divine knowledge is the Holy Spirit to show us how to use that scalpel. And yeah, I want to just reiterate, nothing can really replace that combination. You need the scalpel, the word of God. You really need to know it. That's your job in training. Just like the surgeon trains how to use the scalpel, like in six, seven years of residency, they train hard and long people. And so do we need to train in the word of God every day. And then we need our instructor, the Holy Spirit, to correct us, to show us, and to help us. So get out there today. I want to encourage you. Study the word of God. Pray before you read the word of God that the Holy Spirit will point you into a direction that he wants to show you for that specific day, for that moment in time, because there will be things that you're facing that you need help with. So that's number one. And then obviously you might ask, well, I pray, I try to read my Bible. It's really hard as a busy physician with unpredictable schedules. And I totally get that. It wasn't always easy for me either. And for that reason, I want to share on the next episode, how do you actually establish a life of prayer and staying in the word amidst your busy schedule? Despite all the busyness, how can you as a busy physician Stay in the word and in prayer because that is our key foundation 
we cannot just live on a word a day or or on the Sunday sermon when we are not on call. That is not good enough anymore. I know it's it seems like an incomprehensible thing to get sometimes to do daily quiet time. I have been in situations like that in, in years past. But I want to encourage you with that next episode to dive in very practically what I have done to help me, what you can do, and I give you some tools and resources as well. Have a blessed day. See you next week. Thank you. My prayer is that you were encouraged, strengthened, and perhaps even convicted with this episode today. If this podcast has blessed you, would you help share it with your friends and colleagues and even share it on social media? Also, leave us a review on the podcast platform where you are listening to this content. It would help us a lot. Together, we can share the good news of Jesus and transform medicine, one physician and one patient at a time. Have a great day. God bless.